All right, so welcome back everyone to UCSS Cardiology Grand Rounds. I'm honored to present today, Dr. Luke Jusset, who will be speaking to us on the role of omega-3 supplements in cardiovascular disease prevention. Dr. Jusset is a cardiovascular epidemiologist. He received his MD from the University of Saarlin in Germany and MPH and DSC degrees from Boston University. He is currently an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Associate Professor of Nutrition at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He serves as Director of Research in the Division of Aging at Brigham and Women's Hospital and is Chief Epidemiologist and Director of Science at Maverick, which is a research center within the Boston VA system. His research focuses on the role of dietary factors on the risk of cardiovascular disease. He is currently PI of the Vital Heart Failure Ancillary Study, assessing the effects of omega-3 supplements on heart failure risk. Over the past 20 years, he has served as principal investigator on numerous grants from the NIH and industry and published over 360 scientific papers and book chapters. And with that, welcome Dr. Jusse, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So uh, without further ado, um, let's talk about omega-3 and CVD prevention facts and controversy from the recent clinical trial. So, so here are my disclosures. So here's the outline of my talk. I'm gonna start with a brief slide, a few slides on the CVD trend and burden, uh, the overview of omega-3 fatty acid, where to find them, what they do, and follow with that, what we know from observational data on the role of marine omega-3 and CVD. And then next, the staple of the day, which will be what we know from the randomized clinical trial of omega-3 supplement and CVD, uh, the importance of placebo choice in omega-3 and current controversy, and conclude by future direction and take home message. So, uh, I'm preaching to the choir here, so but a uh, few seconds to refresh everybody's mind on the uh, CV trend in the US uh, between uh, 1900 and 2020. Here, with a peak in the 68 uh, and the decline, although mid 2000, we've seen an increment partly fueled by obesity epidemic and subsequent diabetes. So we flat, we zoom a little bit on the uh, drop between 2000 and 2018. We can see that uh, there's a, a drop in CHT incidence from nearly 200 uh, per thousand to uh, nearly 100 in 2018. Similar uh, decrease in stroke and not so much in heart failure. So um, before the COVID era, the major cause of death in this graph, coronary heart disease with 41% has the lion's share, uh, stroke 17%, heart failure about 10% and other in between. So in terms of dollar uh, amount that it costs, so data from 1996 to um, 2017, 2018, we can see that we went from $100 billion in the late 90s to nearly a quarter of a three trillion dollars between 2017 and 2018. And again, the lounge share in blue will be a CHG related cost from over 50 billion to uh, a little above 100 billion. So uh, very costly. So, uh, if I superimpose the major discovery uh, with the earlier uh, chart with the secular trend in CVD, so starting in the 60s, where the coronary uh, artery bypass graph was uh, introduced, and then followed by the Framingham discovery in the late uh, early 60s with the risk factor of CHD, uh, PCI introduction in the late 70s, and major sad news uh, late 80s. Uh, the FDA approved the stand in 1994 and the physician health study with the aspirin finding in the, in the mid 90s. So you can see uh, a decline from the peak in 1968 uh, before the PCI and statin and stand and other uh, new stuff. 
suggest, just suggesting that we can do something to lower the rate of CBD lifestyle factor, usually smoking, uh, keeping healthy weight, uh, etc. So why do we focus on omega-3? So as I show you, despite the new drug, the new discovery, interventional cardiologists uh, working hard, the burden of CBD remains high in the U.S. and across all industrialized nations. And the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force no longer recommends low-dose aspirin for the prior prevention of CBD in older adults 60 plus, which is the fastest growing segment of the population and where those CBD events are occurring. Uh, and therefore, this becomes important and, uh, to find new uh, tool to prevent CBD. And we think that marine omega-3 fatty acids such as acosapentaenoic acid, EPA, or DHA, standing for docosapentaenoic acid, may be useful. So what are those uh, omega-3 fatty acids that I'm mentioning? So uh, the structure, we have two broader categories, the short chain, such as alpha-linolenic acid, which is not gonna be part of my talk today. And then the long chain, or I'll be referring to as marine omega-3, that's what forms the basis of our talk and what major large randomized control trial have used, EPA, DHA, not so much DPA. So uh, omega-3, the name comes from the fact the three is that the first double bond is at the third carbon from the CHN. So one, two, three, that's where you get the first double bond. That's why we call all them omega-3. Uh, the difference between the EPA and DHA is that the EPA has uh, 20 carbon, the top one, and the DHA has um, 22 carbon. So the EPA is elongated and desaturated to have uh, from five double bond to six double bond. So where do we find omega-3 uh, fatty acid, the marine one, the long chain one, seafood, eggs, meats, dietary supplement that you can buy in a store or prescribe in terms of uh, icosapen ethyl ester. So most Americans will find the omega-3 in fish. So this table to focus on the first two column, which uh, points out where you can get your omega-3 without buying the pill. Salmon, you get about two gram per 100 gram of fish. Salmon, anchovy, herring, mackerel. The lean fish, they, didn't, they tend not to have a larger concentration of uh, EPA and DHA. Although the ALA can be converted into EPA in vivo, that elongates and desaturates activity is very inefficient. So I wouldn't bank on eating flaxseed oil to, uh, as a major source of my omega-3. So what do we know about the physiology of omega-3, in particular EPA, DHA? Uh, number one, uh, from clinical trial, uh, reduction of triglycerides, so the FDA approved um, a CEPR, which is a, a TIL ester of uh, EPA to uh, treat hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, we also know from short-term and sometimes long-term trial that they could uh, reduce inflammation, reduce blood pressure and heart rate, inhibit endothelin one induced cardiac hypertrophy, or uh, block the production of natriuretic peptides, could improve endothelial function and arterial compliance, preserve myocardial structure and function and, and block myocardial fibrosis, improve LV efficiency and inhibit platelet aggregation and uh, sodium potassium channel. And lastly, it could reduce the myocardial demand, oxygen demand. So based on this physiology, now you will see why we focus on CHD, heart failure, in particular when it comes to uh, the effect of omega-3. Uh, before we get to the trial, what was the uh, rigor in uh, observational data that led to the large intervention trial? So fish intake as a major source of EPA DHA in relation to CHD. This meta-analysis show comparing highest versus lowest that there was a 17% lower risk of CHD with fatty fish consumption, but nothing with lean fish. Uh, and you go back to the slide, 
the content of EPA DHA is mostly prevalent in fatty fish. When it comes to CVD combined, uh, this, those respond relation to the left panel here, EPA inversely related with CVD, and to the right, uh, DHA inversely related to CVD in these meta-analysis. Similar response with CAD uh, on the left EPA and on the right DHA, suggesting that uh, EPA DHA may be beneficial from observational design. So here, just showing the effect, uh, the signal is stronger with fatal CAD, like fatal, uh, fatal MI, um, uh, more so than non-fatal CAD or sudden cardiac death with stronger uh, effect size. So when it comes to stroke, um, fish intake in this meta-analysis show a 9% lower risk of stroke comparing the highest with the lowest, that's to, uh, ischemic stroke, uh, and no benefit for hemorrhagic stroke when it comes to fish. Uh, when we derive EPA DHA from the diet and relate to ischemic stroke, here we're seeing that there's a 12% lower risk. So you, you're counting not just fish, but other sources of uh, EPA DHA when you uh, sum up what people are eating in their diet. And when it comes to hemorrhagic stroke, unlike fish, uh, we observe here in this meta-analysis 35% lower risk of uh, hemorrhagic stroke comparing uh, highest versus lower marine omega-3. Those response relation with total stroke show an inverse relation, nonlinear, but um, the nadir around uh, half a gram per day. And when it comes to heart failure, our, uh, we learned from the cardiovascular health study that uh, if you compare infrequent consumption of tuna or broiled baked fish, uh, the more you consume, the lower your risk of developing heart failure. And the magnitude of effects about 30% uh, lower risk comparing uh, three to four a broil or big fish per week versus less than one per month. But the benefit is limited to bake or broil. If you fry your fish, you reversing and it becomes harmful. Uh, here in this case, CHS show fried fish was associated with nearly 40% higher risk of uh, heart failure. And these findings were uh, replicated in the Women Health Initiative. So don't fry your fish if you like fish. Bake or boil or uh, whatever you do, do not fry it. Here, this meta-analysis uh, looking at fish and heart failure, 15% uh, lower risks comparing highest versus lower intake of fish. And Swedish uh, women's uh, studies show uh, inverse relation between dietary uh, omega-3 and risk of heart failure, hospitalization, or mortality. And in Swedish men, similar, but not significant, suggestive of a J-shape. So where the nadir is around 0.4, 0.5 grams per day. So again, uh, when you uh, focus on the EPA DHA um, that you can estimate from the diet, you have about 14% lower risk of heart failure comparing the highest with the lowest risk. And if people would argue, well, self-report is biased, recall bias on measure uh, confounding, uh, what about objectively measure like phospholipid or cholesterol ester? Here in CHS data, measuring plasma EPA and relating it to heart failure risk, uh, those respond inverse relation. Um, and here, the uh, dietary long chain omega-3 overall from different sources, not just from fish, uh, but other food, uh, comparing highest with the lowest intake, you get about 16% lower risk of heart failure. If you analyze this continuously, you get about 6% lower risk of heart failure per standard deviation increment of EPA and DHA in the diet. So what about objectively measure EPA and DHA in blood? So the effect size becomes stronger than estimated through the diet in that you have 41% lower risk comparing highest with the lowest uh, intake of uh, circulating EPA and DHA. And then 
as per standard deviation, 18% lower risk of heart failure per standard deviation increment of serum, EPA, and DHA. So as you noted, the, this is quite stronger effect than dietary estimated with uncertainty. So, uh, so far there's plenty of uh, evidence suggesting that dietary, whether assessed by food frequency questionnaire or measure objectively red blood cell, plasma, uh, could have some benefits with respect to CHD, maybe stroke and heart failure. So let's turn to the trial data with the omega-3 supplements. So what do we know about the physiology from a uh, short-term trial? So the benefit of EPA DHA on coronary plaques. So here, uh, comparing uh, EPA with placebo, here with exception of one Japanese observational study, all the studies here are randomized control trial. We see that there's some benefit of assigning individual patient to EPA DHA and the risk of uh, developing coronary plaques. And the thought is that the plaque would reduce in volume upon administration of EPA DHA. So here, uh, what do we see with when we measure uh, plaque volume in the coronary arteries? So you can see from these uh, small, medium-sized clinical profile that uh, lo and behold, the hypothesis is true that um, administration of EPA DHA reduces the size of the coronary plaques. So does it translate to hot endpoints such as MI? And here again, using uh, these available trial data with uh, EPA DHA, we can see that assignment to EPA DHA resulted in 14% reduction in MI compared to placebo. And I'm going to zoom a little bit in the vital, which was included in the previous slide. So there's some effect modification to take note of. Number one, the effect is stronger in the people eating less fish. 40% reduction of MI in people eating less than 1.5 servings per day. That's a median intake in the vital population. And 77%, almost 80% reduction of MI in African-American assigned to one gram per day of EPA DHA versus uh, olive oil placebo. And lastly, 43% uh, reduction of MI in people with two plus uh, cardiovascular risk factor. So the interaction is significant in all those. So traditional MACE, uh, as primary endpoint, the effect is not uh, large, only 5%, partly because diluted with non-CAD event where the effect size is minimal. But uh, when we examine as those respond relation, uh, EPA, DHA, and CBD overall, including the reduced trial, there's about 9% reduction of CBD uh, risk per gram of EPA, DHA, it's a linear. Uh, when it comes to stroke, uh, so far from large randomized trial of EPA DHA supplement, the overall benefit is no. Uh, the only blip on the radar is a reduced trial that showed 27% reduction of stroke with icosapen ethyl versus mineral oil placebo. Everything else, it's either no or the opposite direction. So when we hone into the reduced trial, it's, we learned that it's not all stroke, it's the benefits is restricted to ischemic stroke with 36% um, reduction of ischemic stroke and no benefit whatsoever for hemorrhagic stroke, uh, second to the uh, last row here with hazard ratio of 1.28. So uh, one thing we got to remember is that the reduce it show benefit on stroke, but it was restricted to ischemic stroke, not hemorrhagic stroke. So how does that compare with the other means of reducing uh, stroke like aspirin, statin, or intensive blood pressure treatment? So here, uh, statin uh, compared to placebo reduced the risk of total stroke by 15%. That's still smaller compared to what we show in reduced 36%. Blood pressure, uh, intensive blood pressure uh, treatment, the spring trial, show 11% um, non-significant reduction in total stroke. 
Um, and when it comes to aspirin, there's some benefit observed in women for total stroke, 15% reduction, and no benefit in men when it comes to aspirin. And for ischemic stroke, uh, the effect size is stronger in women, 24% reduction of ischemic stroke in women and no benefit in men. When it comes to hemorrhagic stroke, aspirin, uh, if anything, uh, it's borderline not significant, but it's going the right direction as you would expect uh, with platelet ag aggregation uh, being inhibited. Uh, so what about atrial fibrillation? So the prevalence of atrial fibrillation currently around um, 8 um, million, uh, but the projection 2050 could be 12 million or uh, 15 million, depending on the increase or stagnation of the rate. So all the trial, all the large trial from vital SN strength, uh, risk and prediction and reducer, GCR uh, and the omega-3 in elderly patient with MI show an increased risk of AFib. So pulled together, we show that there's a 25% increase uh, risk of AFib when people are assigned to EPA DHA. It's not just the four gram that you have and reduce it here or in the strength, but other study that use one gram to show an increased risk in uh, AFib. So the dose, dose matters. So when we stratify by dose, let up to one gram, the risk of AFib was only 12%, still increased, significantly increased, but the risk jump much higher when you give higher dose, more than one gram, we get about almost 50% increased risk of atrial fibrillation. So here, those graphs show the two major study with four grams per day, the reduce it and the strength, and then the uh, older adult with uh, post MI use about 1.8 gram and the rest of the study, they use gram, gram per day. So that's about 11% uh, increment of AFib risk per gram of uh, EPA DHA. So um, what about heart failure? Incidence of heart failure. Here, the two by two factorial design of the vital. Um, so the first heart failure hospitalization, zero, nothing. So you have the placebo and the omega-3, one gram uh, graph, kaplan meier curve, almost superimposed. But the story is slightly different when it comes to recurring heart failure hospitalization where they're separate and the one gram per day versus uh, olive oil shows some benefit when it comes to recurring heart failure hospitalization. And we examined further looking at diabetic versus non-diabetic. And there's a strong interaction in that the benefit is limited to people with prevalent diabetes, where you can see a large separation before uh, six months. And people free of diabetes, it looks like the overall. And this is, heart, uh, this is first heart failure hospitalization. Then we asked the question, what about recurrent heart failure hospitalization? Uh, lo and behold, so uh, it's even stronger, 47% reduction in recurring heart failure hospitalization in people with diabetes, step two, versus 31% first uh, reduction, first heart failure hospitalization in diabetic patients. And we observe no benefit whatsoever in people without diabetes here to the right. So the P4 interaction highly significant. So we examine a race, as I show you the, in the Bible, uh, we observe uh, that people that consume less than one point of five uh, serving of, of, of fish, they have the strongest benefit. So uh, Vital has about 5,000, almost 5,000 African-American. So here, uh, the benefit of uh, omega-3, one gram per day on recurrent heart failure hospitalization was uh, stronger in African-American, 35% reduction, and a non-significant 10% uh, in uh, white participants. So that's something uh, worth uh, noticing for future uh, direction. 
So I'm going to turn the page now to uh, the controversy and the choice of the placebo. So I show you major recent trial produces it's the only one that used mineral oil, partly because they want to match the texture of uh, omega-3 oil and uh, the, uh, the mineral oil texture. A lot of uh, several trials use olive oil, like Viagra, Asan, GC, Origin, and very few, three use corn oil, like the strength trial and the elderly uh, post-MI uh, trial. So um, the uh, major trial of uh, uh, Reduce It um, was published in uh, 19, uh, 2019, and a year later, the strength. So superimposed uh, or side by side on the slide to the left panel, you have the uh, reduce it showing a separation of the couple of Meyer curve. On the right, you have the uh, overlapping curve in strength with the primary endpoint. So uh, one thing to uh, notice from the get go is the placebo choice. Uh, reduce it use mineral oil as a comparator to four gram of EPA, DHA, EPA alone. And the strength use both EPA and DHA, and they use the corn oil as a comparator. So uh, another difference that after one year, the plasma level of EPA went from 21 to 170 microgram per milliliter, and in the strength trial went from 21 to only 90. I didn't show you the uh, jellies trial where that used about two gram. Uh, the increment of plasma EPA uh, was uh, in the 140 from 26 to 140 in, in, in Japan. So uh, in light of these data, people will say, wait a minute, what's going on? One study says EPA is good. The other study say, well, it's not good. So another aspect is that the strength trial used the carboxylic form, meaning not esterify EPA and DHA and versus the ester of five form here, use and reduce it. And some of our work in CHS and elsewhere show uh, the deleterious effect of free fatty acid with respect to uh, heart failure and AFib, uh, to keep in mind. So I, uh, even with the publication of the reduce it, the author, they were concerned because they saw an increase in LDL and they saw us an increase um, in, in CRP in, 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 in the mineral oil group. But they published this paper in 2020 that based on available data, mineral oil does not appear to impact medication absorption because that was the mechanism by which mineral oil could block uh, statin absorption and be reduce the efficacy of statin on uh, LDL lowering potential. And that uh, really, uh, that the impact of the medication absorption or effect related to clinical outcome and therefore does not meaningfully affect study conclusions when used as a placebo at quantity at the quantity used in the clinical trial. So the, uh, the author is kind of putting a disclaimer saying, hey, wait a minute, uh, we believe our finding they're okay. Uh, the little blip increase in LDL or CRP that we report in the original publication, uh, it, it, there's no there there. So. But nonetheless, there was a slew of editorial viewpoint and social media. I'm just gonna show you a few of them here. Uh, this viewpoint uh, here. Um, the participant taking the mineral oil placebo had increases in some lipid and inflammatory biomarker, raising concerns that the cardiovascular benefit might have been an artifact of increased risk in the placebo. So, and this, viewpoint is calling for a new trial using a placebo that's not mineral oil. And it was a subject of talk at the uh, ESC. And here, Dr. Kaufman, uh, Deputy Editor uh, Jama had his uh, uh, piece in Open Heart. And uh, here in circulation, uh, summoning strength to question the placebo and reduce it. Um, here in social media, uh, Dr. Kronholz at Yale took to TikTok. Uh, he has a lengthy uh, a monologue here. She's take on the reduce it finding. Uh, here the Atlantic, fish oil is good, no bad, no good, no weight. 
So people kind of all over the place not uh, know what to do. Or well, here in uh, MD Edge, smoking gun, you reduce the data rekindle controversy over its placebo. But I'm going to spend maybe a few seconds more on this editorial by Bob Harrington in CERC uh, last year, where uh, it's more a uh, measure in that quote, the data presented raised a difficult question, not of whether Axapen et al. improves clinical outcomes in high-risk cardiovascular patients, but of the magnitude of that benefit and whether that benefit is sufficient, rob sufficiently robust for recommendations to guide clinical practice. So basically, uh, he's also calling for a new trial to settle uh, this debate. What does mineral oil do uh, that could take away the benefit reported and reduce it? So here, taking about 160 CKD patients undergoing uh, hemodialysis, you focus on the right part of uh, this slide here, looking at CRP, at time zero, 60 uh, days and 120 days. There's no difference in uh, CRP in this group, but it's a peculiar group. So uh, Dr. Ritker from uh, Brigham and colleague, including uh, uh, Deepak from Brigham as well, they reanalyze uh, specimen collected and reduce it. They have blazed on sample 12 months, 24 months and at the end of the study, and they measure atherogenic biomarkers such as LDL, CRP, IL-6, IL-1 beta, oxidized LDL, uh, LP little a, and so forth. So here you can see in orange, uh, the mineral oil, what it did to all those atherogenic biomarkers, everything went up. So across the board, so which poses a problem. And in this study, uh, they concluded that the core design of reduce it does not make it possible to resolve convincingly whether any advent, uh, effect associated, adverse effect associated with mineral oil use as, uh, as uh, a comparator may have affected clinical outcomes. And that resolution of this controversy can only be addressed formally by either undertaking a biomarker trial randomly as locating patient to uh, mineral oil of uh, and a full neutral placebo or by a second trial using non-mineral oil comparator. And they stress the fact that only the latter is gonna be possible due to ethical consideration. So we've spent what, about two years trying to convince the NIH to give us money to do just that, but uh, it's a topic for another day, hopefully, when I have uh, better news. So um, I'm going to uh, wrap up here and leave time for questions. So what do we know? What can we take home? So based on the evidence that I presented, both from observational data and from uh, large randomized control trial, it's safe to say that EPA DHA supplement reduces uh, the risk of MI, in particular, the fatal one, the fatal CHD, and that EPA DHA supplement increases the risk of atrial fibrillation. So all the trials show that uh, adverse effect. Uh, emerging data that needs confirmation would be the role of EPA supplementation on ischemic stroke, in part, uh, reduces the only trial that shows some benefit. Uh, vital did not, the other did not. Uh, and then with respect to incident heart failure, in particular recurrent heart failure hospitalization among type two diabetic. So that's something that's a promising, but a warrant confirmation. So um, new randomized control trial is desperately needed to resolve the mineral oil controversy. Other important gaps that needs further clarification include a lack of the optimal, optimal dose of omega-3. Is it one gram? Is it two gram? Is it four gram? Especially given the high risk of uh, atrial fibrillation with higher dose. It's unclear whether EPA is equally uh, beneficial as DHA and uh, no data so far on omega-3 and heart failure subtype. Vital with two, uh, we don't have enough event to do sub-analysis by heart failure uh, type. And then 
obviously confirming the benefit of omega-3 on ischemic stroke, given the U.S. Prevention uh, Services Task Force on the uh, indication of aspirin for uh, primary prevention in older adults. So I'm going to stop here and be more than happy to take uh, questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Juse. Uh, that was a great talk. So we have a good amount of time for questions. If anybody does have a question for Dr. Juse, feel free to raise your hand um, or leave it in the chat box. It looks like, or, hey, Dr. Kaiser, you have a question for Dr. Juse. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Luke. That was a terrific overview of this very important topic that unfortunately continues to confound us. Um, what I wanted to ask you about, I, I'm still very intrigued by the differential associations or the differential effects with atrial fibrillation on the one hand, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease on the other. So I, I was hoping that you could touch a little bit more on what might be the mechanisms um, on, you know, driving atrial fibrillation um, and on the one hand, and then on the other, if you could also talk a little bit about what you might expect the impact of omega-3 fatty acids might be on HEFPEF versus HEFREF, because you found that the effect is preferentially seen in, in people with diabetes or in people of African descent, and at least diabetes tends to drive more HEFPEF uh, dysmetabolic. So I'm just curious on your thoughts on that, sec that second point as well. Great. Uh, those are very excellent questions. So I wish I had a great answer, especially for the AFib one. So AFib one is puzzling. Uh, you recall the sudden cardiac death uh, earlier trial with uh, Dr. Albert and other Mass General, where animal studies show one thing, uh, human studies show the other thing. So um, the biologic mechanism, whether uh, the omega-3, EPA, DHA, predisposed to arrhythmia, uh, it's not quite clear and it's still subject to further investigation. So I wish I had a better answer for you today, but I would say uh, stay tuned. We may have a better answer uh, in the future where we hopefully get some money to do more in this area. Uh, to the second question, um, when it comes to the subtype. So uh, vital, unfortunately, we don't have enough. We have about 20, the most 60 subtype because not everybody, as you know, uh, they either don't consent for medical record review. By the time they give consent, they move and you don't get what you need. Uh, it's really hard. So I don't have enough data, but a, a first peak and to what we have, it's exactly what you suggested. We're seeing stronger effect with HEFPEF than with HEFREF. Uh, HEF so, uh, but it's too small. That's why that paper hasn't gone anywhere because I'm still hoping that uh, we're gonna get more record, even though it's false to assume that upon several years that the tri ended people can still be analyzed as intention to treat. People, they may have sweet crossover, what have you, but still uh, it would be enough pilot data to convince uh, the NIH or industry or both to say, okay, let's look closely into this. Uh, do we see a differential effect, half PEF versus half REF when it comes to EPA DHA? But that's one thing that I hope, I wish I had enough event within VITAL to answer. I'm still hoping uh, we're busy adjudicating whatever we get uh, to increase that uh, sample size, in particular the number of events, uh, to see whether we can have something solid that is believable, because I hate to publish paper with 10 events or 15 events. It's not just believable. And just a quick follow-up. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up. For the recurrent heart failure hospitalizations, so at baseline, what was the mix of HEFPEF, HEFREF at entry into the trial? Do you have data on that? I don't have on top of my head, but uh, it wasn't an exclusion to be enrolled in uh, CHD worse, but not heart failure. So um, there were, I uh, believe my memory may fail me, but there were six, six cases with heart failure at 
the beginning, a baseline of vital, so not many. But again, we didn't review the medical record of everybody. They could be on uh, diagnose, uh, you know, um, cardiomyopathy, which some may call it uh, heart failure and not require hospitalization that we could have missed. Mm -hmm. Great, any other questions for Dr. Jusse? Looks like Dr. Tang, you have a question? Uh, sure, hi, thank you so much for the helpful talk and a confusing topic. Uh, Pardon if I miss your mentioning BICEPA, is that, what are your thoughts there? What do, what do we share with patients on its poten potential similar adverse effect? Thank you. Yeah, uh, the VASIPA is the, uh, the, the brand name for Acosap and Ethyl. Um, it's purely synthetic uh, EPA. Um, and it was used in reduce it as a solo drug versus the, uh, the strength trial used EPA and DHA combined, Sim similar to uh, vital and other major uh, trial. The only study that used EPA alone was the jellies. Uh, trial in Japan where fish consumption it's it's high. So uh, for patient when it comes to triglyceride uh, lowering effect, you got to take everything into context. If everything else has failed and the triglyceride are still elevated, and uh, EPA or vasipa is the only uh, alternative that you want to consider, I would say uh, it's safe to, uh, to to use it and keeping in mind the lower the dose that you can get away and get the triglyceride right in check, the better, given the potential for atrial fibrillation. And for patient with either paroxysmal AFib, I will be more uh, concerned or monitor them more frequently than the one that you have any evidence that they have uh, a history of, of arrhythmia or AFib. Thank you, that's helpful. Any other questions for Dr. Jusse? Dr. Sang, do you have a question? Hi, hi Luke, this is a, a wonderful summary of, of the subject. And I had a question and a comment about the, the point that was raised about um, dis, disparate evidence for arrhythmias and sudden death. Um, as I saw, as you showed that mortality uh, curve over time and what our various interventions have been. Um, late in the mid-2000s was ICDs, and that could account for some of that drop, as you, as you showed in that later curve, um, as, as a very significant intervention in terms of reducing sudden death rates. But one issue that has been raised is, is our adjudications of sudden cardiac death and assuming that those are all arrhythmic. Um, as you know, we and others have shown, it, it, it's, it's almost a coin flip when somebody dies suddenly, whether it's truly arrhythmic. So I, I wonder if that could explain it. But one, one way to do that, such a study would be to do it in ICD patients where looking at appropriate shocks and you know that it was an arrhythmic event and looking at the effect of omega-3s in that population, do you know of any of such studies? There was smaller study uh, back then, maybe 10, 15 years ago with ICD, but they were small, not, nothing large. Uh, that I know of, but uh, I agree with you that when you have the ICD, you can interrogate and see exactly what happened. It's more accurate and reliable than us being at the mercy of getting permission from the patient to get medical records, uh, bugging offices to send us a record to hospital, and not everybody complies, not top priority for everybody. They have primary for patient care and sec secondary research. So. It's sometimes it's uphill battle uh, to get the record. So um, I would say yes, if somebody were to uh, propose a study focusing on the use of ICD to sort out uh, the arrhythmia angle of EPA DHA, uh, that would be uh, very helpful in addressing some of the uh, gap that we don't know much about. So um, I would say currently, um, you know, we, we, we try industry route. Uh, Amarin is not interested. 
So they're selling the drug like crazy. So they don't want to fund any anything that may jeopardize their benefit. Um, and other manufacturer, you know, the money is not there. So um, to fund individually another large trial to address all those important stuff. So what we have left, the NIH. Uh, so NIH, the first time we approached them, they say, well, uh, 60 million, absolutely not. So, uh, and and they rather fund, they go to fund about 100 R1. So why give uh, most of that money to one study? So we're, we're being creative, uh, trying to negotiate uh, lower indirect or removing indirect costs on the drug and partnering with uh, generic manufacturer to see if we can lower the costs of the drug uh, and the placebo and finding some uh, institute that will co-fund like selling the, and I, I think we were able to convince the NINDS that stroke is important, that based on this solid evidence that we have at least something to ratify that's better than aspirin, statin, and blood pressure lowering. Um, and we're still working on the third partner, the VA, see if the VA can help out with the co-funding. Um, and then next month, we have another meeting with uh, Dr. Goff at the NHLBI to see if he, he, he has some appetite for the new number, budget number that we have. So, give permission to, for such endeavor to, to move forward. So, uh, because if that thing were to take off, so that would be an opportunity to build in those uh, questions, uh, probably through ancillary study, which will be a regular R1 mechanism to answer the ICD uh, uh, question or other uh, question that uh, could be answered in the setting of a control trial. It, you could easily do a retrospective study now and look at um, remote interrogations and ICD shock rates and then exposures in those patients to see if there's additional support for the hypothesis. That would be relatively easy to do retrospective. And then, then you have even more ammunition to, uh, you know, hopefully get funding. That's true. <laughs> The bandwidth. So if you have, a, if if you know anybody who might be interested, yep, you have, uh, you have, you have a great on. group of EPs there at Brigham. I'm sure uh, you know they they could maybe it'd be easy to look. Pretty up. sure they're busy frying yeah. bigger fish. <laughs> who knows? But yeah, no pun intended. I won't give up easily. But uh, any any idea, any suggestion, that's helpful. It's for the sake of good science, helping patients. So uh, I agree. Mm -hmm. That's great. Any any other comments or questions for Dr. Jusay? If not, thank you so much, Dr. Jusay, again, for spending the time with us today and, and sharing with us all this evidence uh, surrounding omega-3 and things to look forward to in the field. Hopefully there will be some more RCTs for us to hang our hats on as we advise patients. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.